told him I could wall builders. Uh, we've been going through the last many weeks uh, the one room schoolhouse, and now that school is starting to wrap up for people. This week, next week, hopefully you are finishing. If you were homeschooled, maybe you finished like a month ago, or you have the parents that are like, nope, we do school all year long because that's ridiculous. I don't know. But hopefully you are coming toward the end of the school year. We thought we would spend some time um, over the coming weeks and spend a little time in, in the Founder's Bible. First of all, we do love the Bible, believe in the Bible, encourage people to read, steady, know, live according to the Bible. We liked it so much, we wrote our own. Well, no, we didn't. <laughs> not quite. We didn't, we didn't do that. Not quite. Uh, but if you're not familiar, the Founder's Bible is something that we did several years ago. Uh, there, there was a, a gentleman who came in, his name was Brad Cummings, and uh, he had done work uh, on some films, he had done some writing, and we just started showing him some things from our history collection. He says, this is amazing. Um, there's a, a edition of the Bible that used to be a big deal and they're trying to make a push for again. It'd be so cool if you took so many of the quotes from the Founding Fathers about the Bible, about Scripture, and put it in the Bible. So that's literally what we did with the Founders Bible, was as you go through the Founders Bible, you'll come to different verses, and, and, and we've put sticky notes in a few that we're going to talk about some, but we have quotes from the Founding Fathers. We have it all footnoted, so you can go back and you can find it in their writings. Again, we'll talk about some of this today, um, but it coincides with a specific verse from the Bible. So what we thought would be fun is, is spend a little time just going through some specific Bible verses and, and showing what Founding Fathers said about those or how they use those. And the one we thought, especially now that it's kind of the end of the school year, is in Ecclesiastes 12.1 is where, where Solomon, if, if you know the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon was the wisest king that ever lived, maybe the wisest man in the history of the world, right? Arguably, except he did a lot of foolish things for a wise he's man. A poor wise guy, yes, right? right? Seemingly odd. He didn't, he didn't practice what he preached very well. No, either. and right, the, the Bible says too that he had he married women from like all over the world trying to make his nation stronger, and they served false gods, and, and they led his heart astray. Right, so really made some foolish decisions along the way, but Ecclesiastes 12 is a summation where he talks about the point of life, and he says life is meaningless. It, the, the, the whole thing, all the pursuits you can have, they don't satisfy. He finishes in chapter 12, the last chapter of the book, and says, here's the main end of life. The, the, the main point of life is to know God and to serve God, and, and this is what you should do. Well, it just so happens that in Ecclesiastes 12, there is a, a guy we consider founding father, Noah Webster, and we'll give you much more of his bio in a minute. But Noah Webster did a whole bunch of books for kids. And so this is an elementary spelling book. And again, we'll talk about some of his influence with education in just a moment. But the very last page in this elementary spelling book is Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Almost as if to say, now that you have done all of these spelling words, right, almost where we are today, the school year is over, let me remind you of one thing, and it starts off, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, etc. It goes on to the whole chapter, but he's reminding them of what the Bible said, and this is an elementary spelling book, this wasn't really unusual for, for Noah Webster, because he was a guy of faith, which is evident through much of what he did. Well, he didn't start out as a guy of faith. Now, he, he was in the American Revolution, he's a soldier in the Revolution, after the Revolution, he becomes a legislator, he becomes a, a, a judge, he's very active, actually, he's the second guy in America to call for the Constitutional Convention. He said, we really need a federal constitution. Articles aren't doing it. Let's Articles Confederation. Let's have a constitution. So he, he really is, by all measures, a founding father. But all that time, he was not yet a Christian. He said he went back to Yale University, the university from which he graduated. And in 1809, when he went back for a visit on campus, they were having a big revival. All these students were coming to Christ. And that actually is part of the Second Great Awakening. And so when he was there, he heard this message of personal relationship with Christ. He bought into that message. It changed his life. He completely transformed. And actually, uh, he's known for his dictionary. And this dictionary right here is not the original. We have the original, which is two volumes. This dictionary came out just shortly after his death. He died in 1843. And in the front of this dictionary... Yeah, this one came out in 1845. And, and actually, so even in the Founder's Bible, we do have a little excerpt. Um, that they put in there, and, and I'm going to read this excerpt, and then Jonathan's going to show you something in there as well. But here's what they said about Webster. They said, Webster was a schoolmaster of our republic. 
uh, has left the standard of the English language, which will guide all successive ages. He grew up with his country. He molded the intellectual character of her people. Not a man has sprung from her soil on whom he has not laid his all-forming hand, which is impressive. His principles of language have tinged every sentence that is now or will ever be uttered by an American tongue. Only two men, this is what's cool, only two men have stood on the new world whose fame is sure to last. Columbus, its discoverer, and Washington, its savior. Webster is and will be its greatest teacher, and these three make our trinity of fame. Now, that's how he was remembered, and that is what was even written in the front of this 1845 dictionary. But that's not the only thing they wrote about Webster in it. What else do they have in there? Yeah, they also go through the story of his conversion and what happens to him after he gets saved, listening to this minister at Yale. And I'll pick up just right here, and he says that, under a sense of this responsibility, he took up the study of the Bible with painful solicitude. As he advanced the objections which he had formerly painful entertained. Painful solicitude doesn't mean it hurt him to study the Bible. <laughs> he, he was yeah, very meticulous. Serious. Very, yeah. I mean, he really went into details on it. Uh, the objections which he had formerly entertained against the humbling doctrines of the gospel were wholly removed. He felt their truth in his own experience. He felt that salvation must be holy of grace. And then it continues on, but it's so interesting that right in the dictionary published after his death, uh, one of the things that the editors thought was very important for the readers of the dictionary to know is Noah Webster's personal testimony in his conversion to Christ. And right, that conversion to Christ led him to do many of the things that he did afterwards. Um, and, and by the way, some of the impressive things, like oh, this dictionary, yeah. even inside the dictionary, the guy, he, he, there was no. This is the first American dictionary, first one done in America that defined words. So all the time he was working on this, and he spent more than twenty and, years and, on and it. And to clarify, there was an English dictionary that was done back in the early Samuel Johnson and others. Um, and it didn't go into nearly as much detail, but again, that was English. And Webster looked at a lot of what was done in English and thought. Yeah, no. we don't we don't speak English. No. <laughs> we speak American. American, that's right. Uh, we've been speaking freedom since 1776. It's totally different than English. That's right. And so his thought was, right, we, we need to have more of an English vernacular and, and English spelling, English definitions. There's a lot of words we use today that weren't used back then. He learned 26 languages yeah. to be able to do this dictionary because he took everything back to the root. I, I mean, I, that's just mind-boggling. Yeah. Twenty-six again, but, and, and he that's kept crazy. a list of all these words we had in America. They didn't have in England. There was no definition for skunk. There was no definition for chowder. No definition for hickory. And so, if you're in America, you hear all these words and you can't define them. So he had thousands of words. He literally defined seventy thousand words in this dictionary. And as you said, took everyone back to its original root. I mean, the the meticulous time that went into yeah. that. Plus, uh, and by the way, once he. Once he had defined all these words and got an American definition, he says, you know, the King James Bible is really good, but there's a bunch of words in that that were spoken in Great Britain that we don't speak over here. Like if I talked about going out and tending the kine, K-I-N-E, Americans don't know what that is. It's cattle. He said, so there's 400 words in the Bible that need to be moved into American language. So this is the first modern language Bible, and he tells you all 400 words. He wants you to know he's not messing with God's word. He's just going to update some words, and so kind becomes kind. Yeah, so at the front of the Bible, he outlines those, but even in the dictionary, it was estimated that, that of his original dictionary, 25% of the definitions that he gave were from the Bible, referencing the Bible. So again, yeah, I mean, this guy's faith is very evident. He was known as a schoolmaster to America, so did a lot to shape education in America. And, and again, even at the end of his, his elementary spelling book, he said, okay, kids, you've come to the whole book. Here's, here's one thing. At the very end of the book, here's the thing you need to remember. And it starts off with a thought of remembering your creator. And especially now as, as the school year is coming to a close, this is an interesting thought and concept that in, in much of American culture for generations, this was a, a, a promotion by ministers, by political leaders, by founding fathers, that we need to remember who God is. Much of modern culture has kind of lost that recognition or even even why it matters that we remember who God is because maybe there's some people to go well no, I mean I know who God is but but why is it really a big deal why should we teach that to kids in school why does this matter and, and yeah Jonathan is opening up in 
in Webster's history book. Yeah, this is actually Webster's book. It's the history of the United States. And there's a lot of fun things about this. Like if I were just to, to open it up to the first page. Now, history of the United, United States. United States. And the first line on the history of the United States says. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then it continues on going through the story so of creation. Have the United States, if there's not an Earth, and who created the Earth? So I, I really find that humorous. Yeah, having that kind of a, a uh, eternal perspective and a global perspective it's, it's when so you're studying cool. America. But as you go to the end of the book, he kind of similar to the spelling book, right? What does he want to leave you with? He wants to leave you with some specific thoughts about Christianity, about God, and he says. Uh, specifically talking about the Bible and Christianity's relationship with uh, uh, America, he says, All the miseries and evils which men suffer from vice, crime, ambition, injustice, oppression, slavery, and war proceed from their despising or neglecting the precepts contained in the Bible. So he's saying, right, if you want to have a good nation, a good country, right, we've, we've just studied the entire history of America— with the words that I taught you how to spell, uh, if we're going to maintain the kind of the route that we're going, you have to remember God, which is right the same and, lesson and that he ends with. This, with. this lesson that he ends with is remember now that creator in the days of thy youth is, I think, one of the most important lessons, and not just for young people, but for every person, to be God conscious. And not just to be God conscious. The Bible says even the devil believes in God. He trembles at that. It, it's being God conscious and particularly accountability to God yeah. conscious. If you're conscious that you account to God for what you say, what you do, for for your thoughts, your behavior, your words, you, you'll behave differently. Which, which is, by the way, is what the Bible teaches. That's right. The Bible teaches that you do give an account, right? Mm -hmm. For I mean, you, you can go to the Gospels where Jesus talks about for, for the very the, the, the idle words that we speak, the things we think, that's not really a big deal. No, even the little things that we think aren't a big deal. We'll give an account for everything we do, for everything God's given us, for the things we have stewardship over, for, for our families, our relationship, our finances. But, but part of helping us remember that we're going to be accountable is remembering there is a guy That's right. who does hold us accountable. And in the early constitutions, so often in the early state constitutions, the founders said, we don't want you holding office unless you have a belief in future rewards and punishments. That someday you're going to stand before God and answer for what you said, for what you thought, for what you did. And, and that's so good because in, in politics, 99% of what happens in politics happens outside of our view. But you know what? If I'm in office and I know I'm going to answer to God for what I do, I'm going to do what's right even if nobody's watching me. And so the, the thought of being God conscious because you're God accountable, oh, that'll change your behavior toward, toward your family, toward neighbors, yeah. toward people that see you, people that don't see you. It doesn't matter. You'll have a good behavior, and that's a, that's a great lesson. Yeah. Yeah. Jonathan, what's that last piece you Well, have? you're talking about accountability. One of the favorite artifacts, I think actually, even outside of Webster, one of my favorite artifacts in the library that we have is from Noah Webster, and it's kind of talking about uh, his his perspective, perspective rather on accountability. This is a handwritten note by Noah Webster. You can see it's signed right there by him at the bottom, Noah Webster. But what it is is he's asking to be excused from Sunday school. He calls it the Sabbath school. But he's writing uh, and says that I must pray to be excused from attending the Sabbath school because he's going to be busy. So, right, even in the little things, he's like, look, I have to be accountable for my actions. So can I, uh, you know, get out of Sunday school this week, guys? <laughs> can I miss is, this one? It's just so funny. When we think about Noah Webster and, we, and, and the founding fathers in general, so often we think about the really big things that they did. But we don't think about them going to Sunday school, <laughs> sure. or much less like writing a note, being like, "Hey, sorry, I missed. I'm nearly always there, yeah. but forgive me, I had to miss this one time. I had an option of this sort of thing." No, it's just I, I love that art art of that. So but. one of the things again, we're we're gonna spend a little time going through the Founders Bible. Um, it, it is a really cool work. If you guys want to find out more about it, you know the Wall Builders website. Uh, you, you can look and see more details about the Founders Bible. It's, it's available uh, in digital form, so you can get it on, on an iPad or iTunes or whatever else kind of smart device you have. Um, but it's a really cool way that not just to study the Bible, which is the number one thing we would recommend, yeah. right? Even if you didn't know American history, you should know the Bible. Study the Word of God because it's so practical, it's so beneficial for us. But one of the cool ways to see how the Bible literally shaped America 
and shaped the founding fathers, shaped our policy, shaped right all these different aspects of even our normal everyday life in America, the Founders Bible is a really cool way that makes that connection because as you see these verses, you then see quotes from founding fathers, you see where it came implemented in law and public policy, etc. So it's a cool way to see that. Um, again, we're praying for you guys as, as we comment always. Uh, if you have any comments or questions, drop them in the comment box. We'll try to get to them when we can, and we'll see you guys later.